All right, so with the second half of the notes, we're going to start to look at when a use substitution is possible and when it's not. Um, and the weird thing is that sometimes a function that looks like it's more complicated actually has a derivative, and a function that looks simpler actually does not. So if you look at this first example, um, if you're trying to take the integral of 3x squared cosine x cubed, it has an answer, because it looks like that undoing the chain rule thing. You know, you've got your nested function of x cubed, you've got its derivative of 3x squared, so it's got an answer. It looks pretty complicated, but it has an antiderivative. If you compare it to the cosine of x cubed, the cosine of x cubed actually does not have an antiderivative, nothing that we're capable of doing now anyway. And that's because it's got a nested function, but the correction factor isn't anywhere in there. Now, because the correction factor is supposed to be a 3x squared, I told you before, we can't just throw in variables. You can throw in constants and balance them out, because a constant's just a constant. You can't say, like, oh, I'll just throw in an x squared and then balance it with a 1 over x squared. Definitely does not work like that. So this actually does not have an antiderivative. Nothing that we are capable of doing so far. So let's compare these next two. Square root of 1 plus 2x. Does that have an answer? Okay, so my nested function is 1 plus 2x. Its derivative is 2. Even though I don't see a 2 there, I can mess with constants. I can throw in the 2 that should be there and balance it out with a 1 half. So yes, this one would have an answer. Next one, square root of 1 plus 2x squared. The nested function is, of course, 1 plus 2x squared. The derivative that we're expecting is a 4x. We don't see a 4x. We cannot balance out variables. We can balance out constants. We cannot balance out variables. So no, this one does not have an antiderivative. Okay? So just to keep some of those in mind while you're looking at your functions to say like, oh, well, this one seems like it's a pretty simple function. It should have an antiderivative. And that actually doesn't really have anything to do with it. Because sometimes the super complicated ones have derivatives and the simple ones don't. Okay, so a few more examples. And this should go relatively quickly, actually, while we're trying to get these set up. So we're looking for something that looks like it's nested. So if you look at this one, the denominator definitely looks like it's a nested function. Okay, so let's start to write this out. So u equals, we've got 4x cubed plus 3x squared. So to take the derivative, we write du equals, we get a 12x squared plus 6x, and then we always follow it up with a dx. This is not exactly what we see right here. All right, but we do see six times that value. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by six here. So I'm going to write one-sixth du is equal to 2x squared plus x. Okay, so this 2x squared plus x dx can get replaced with a one-sixth du. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite my integrand. Instead of having a u squared in the denominator, I'm going to write u to the negative second. And then we just wrote how this 2x squared plus x dx can be replaced with a 1 6th du. And just like the last lesson, any time a constant appears like that, just throw it outside the integrand. We'll multiply it in, in a little bit. So I've got my 1 6th. Right now we're worried about the antiderivative of u to the negative second. So my power was negative 2. We're going to bring it up 1 to negative 1 and then divide by a negative 1. Okay, and then don't forget your plus c. Okay, so the whole thing is going to be negative, negative 1, over, I've got a 6 from this 1 sixth, and then since this is u to the negative first, I'm going to put that one copy of u down in the denominator. Okay, and then of course plus c. Okay, next one. So this one's a little weird. I've got Natural log of x definitely appears to be a nested function. It's plugged into a squared function. The derivative of natural log, not natural log of x is 1 over x, and this actually does have a 1 over x in there, because the x is written in the denominator. All right, so we've got everything we need. So we're going to make a u substitution out of natural log. And then for du, the derivative of natural log is 1 over x, and then we write our dx. So it's actually in there, that 1 over x dx is the dx over x part. So we can just directly sub that out. So we write this as the dx over x gets replaced with the du. And then I have natural log of x squared in the denominator. So actually, just like the one up above, this is my u to the negative second. Except with this one, I don't have any constants to mess with. 
So my antiderivative, as I know from right up here, is negative u to the negative first plus c. So I can write this as negative 1 over, and then I put a natural log in the denominator, plus c. Okay, so that would be my antiderivative. Remember, you can always take the derivative again, and you will see that you land right back at the original integrand. Okay, so next one's a little weird. Integral of tangent. I mean, it seems like the only option would be tangent, but tangent's derivative is secant squared, and that's not in there anywhere. So this is, this is one of the downfalls of doing videos, because every once in a while we'll see a problem like this, and I'll be like, well, what do you guys think? How should we rewrite this? However, of course, we are not all together right now. We are listening to this video in the comfort of our own homes, so I just kind of have to give it away for you. So maybe think for a second about how you could possibly rewrite tangent. That would give way to a u substitution. And if you thought sine over cosine, you are in fact correct. Way to go. Okay, so we do a quick rewrite there. Then the problem becomes, okay, I could use sine and its derivative is cosine, or I could use cosine and its derivative is negative sine, and we could always play around with the constant. What we have to use, though, we have to use the one that's in the denominator. Say I chose sine. If I chose sine, its derivative is cosine. I don't have a cosine in that integrand. I have a 1 over cosine in that integrand. And 1 over cosine is not the derivative of sine. So I have to choose the cosine. Okay, so I choose cosine. And then my derivative is negative sine. Oops, sine x. almost forgot that. And of course, because I have a sine x dx, this tells me I can replace it with a negative du. And I'm just going to throw that constant out front. Okay, so let's replace our integrand. So this integral becomes, instead of having this cosine, this is going to be u to the negative first. I have a cosine in the denominator, so I'm going to write it as u to the negative first. And then sine x dx gets replaced with the negative du. Okay, so I know I have my negative out front when I take the antiderivative, because I've got that right here. The antiderivative of u to the negative first, or 1 over u, is natural log. It's natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. If we try to do a power rule on this, our power would go up to 0 and we try to divide by 0. Hopefully we know by now that we can't do that. So we sub this back in. This is the negative natural log of the absolute value of cosine. So that's now one more that you can add to your list. We now know what the antiderivative of tangent is. The negative natural log of the absolute value of cosine. It's very pretty, nice and neat. So you can actually use that same technique to get... Um, cotangent, cosecant, secant, derivatives or antiderivatives that we did not have before. But now we can get those antiderivatives using the substitution method. Okay, so now we're getting more into some of the complicated u substitutions. All right, um, this next one, when you see that the integrand doesn't have a multiple of the nested function, if you see our nested function is just an x plus 1. And you're like, okay, great, so there's an x plus 1, its derivative is 1, fantastic. However, there's this extra sneaky little copy of x in there. Okay, so we're going to walk through exactly what we would do with that. So you'd start out your problem just the way you think you should. And you're like, all right, great, u is x plus 1. So that means that du is just 1 dx. So du and dx just make a direct swap, one out for the other. However, I've told you guys that our entire purpose is to change the entire integrand to be in terms of u instead of in terms of x. So we've still got this little issue right here. We've got this x that's just kind of hanging out out front. Just mind in its own business, but it's not a u. So actually, again, just like the last one, this would have been a great time for me to open it up to you as to what you guys think we should do with this. And the answer, if you thought this, That answer is correct. If you know that u is equal to x plus 1, if we just do a little subtraction, that means that x is equal to u minus 1. And so we can just sub that out. All right, so let's write what we have so far. Integral of, so that x gets replaced with a u minus 1. And then the x plus 1 gets replaced with a u to the ninth, And then the dx gets replaced with the du. Okay, so it still looks somewhat foreign, like not like something that we know how to take the antiderivative of very easily, but then some, some simplification comes into play. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to distribute that u to the ninth. 
And now everything just fits with a nice, neat power rule. Okay, so the u to the 10th, the antiderivative is 1 11th u to the 11th minus, and then the antiderivative u to the 9th is 1 10th u to the 10th, and then we have our plus c. So I'm going to sneak this actually right up above. Okay, make sure that's all on the screen there, and there we go. That is our final answer. So you might have to do some extra substituting, even substituting that isn't directly involved with the correction factor. Okay, we need to make sure every single thing in that integrand can get replaced with a u. Okay, so these next ones we're doing kind of the same thing, a little bit of rearranging. Your exact nested derivative isn't going to appear with all of these, but we can rearrange the function and make a second substitution, just like we did with example 8. Okay, so your choice of u is still going to be pretty obvious. You're like, oh, okay, this function looks like it's nested inside of another function. That's going to be my u. But then you have to work a little bit to figure out what else should go in there. Okay, so this one, u equals, it's still the x cubed plus 1 that you think it probably is supposed to be. Then du equals 3x squared dx. And so you're looking at this, what you've got so far, you're like, okay, I don't have a 3x squared. Um, you do sort of have an x squared. Okay, so now here's the part that gets a little weird. If you look at the very beginning of that integrand, you have an x to the fifth. Okay, x to the fifth is x squared times x cubed. And that's what we're going to use. Because this brings to mind an x squared. So we could use that. So we could say that x squared dx is equal to one-third du, so we've got a substitution for the x squared. So this x squared is covered, this x cubed plus 1 is covered, this dx is covered. The only thing that's not covered is an x cubed. Well, very similar to what we did up above, we can sub out this x cubed. So if u is equal to x cubed plus 1, that means x cubed is equal to u minus 1. And now we've got everything covered. Okay, so let's rewrite that integrand. Integrand of the x squared gets replaced with a 1 3rd du. The x cubed gets replaced with a u minus 1. And then this, the x cubed plus 1 under a square root, gets replaced with u to the 1 half. And then the dx was part of this. The dx got replaced with the x squared dx. It got replaced by 1 third du. So I've got everything I need in there. So just like the one up above, I'm going to simplify up a little bit. I'm going to distribute that u to the 1 half. So I get u to the 3 halves minus u to the one-half du. Now I'll take my antiderivative. Don't forget about the one-third. Remember, it multiplies to everything. Here my power pops up to five-halves, and I divide by five-halves. Minus, here my power pops up to three-halves, and I divide by three-halves. And then the plus c just kind of tags along on the outside there. Okay, so I'm going to distribute that one-third, and then I'm going to sub my u back in. Okay, so that first coefficient is a nice 2 fifteenths, and then x cubed plus 1 raised to the 5 halves power. It's very nice. And then minus, my next coefficient is a 2 ninths, if I distribute that 1 third, times x cubed plus 1 to the 3 halves, and then of course plus c. Okay, so you can see these are definitely starting to get slightly more complicated as we go. We're using the u-substitution method, but in a very strange way. Okay, number two, we're going to do something similar with this. You still do have a good sense of how to pick out what your u should be. It's always going to be the function that looks physically nested. It's the function that's nested inside of another function is this, the z cubed plus 1. Okay, so very similar to the one up above, the derivative is 3z squared dz this time. We always kind of go with whatever our variable is. And so this right here, we don't have a z squared. We do have this, whatever this is that we've got going on. All right, so z squared, I can factor this out. Okay, so that is this piece right here. So instead of this, I'm going to replace it with this. z squared 
and then times the quantity z cubed plus 4. Okay, so that's where I'm at so far. I'm going to rewrite this as 1 third du. So that z squared dz, the z squared dz, I'm going to replace it with a 1 third du. Now here in parentheses, I have a z cubed plus 4, similar to my u substitution, but not quite. So if we look at this example right here, I again, if we were in class, would ask you what you think we would do. And the answer is we add 3 to both sides. This is a z cubed plus 1. This is a z cubed plus 4. The way to make this equal this is to add 3. So if we add 3 to both sides, we get this. Okay, sorry about that scribble I just put in the page. So now we can sub out everything. So my integrand becomes the z squared dz I'm replacing with a 1 third du. The z cubed plus 4 gets replaced with a u plus 3. And then the z cubed plus 1 to the 12th gets replaced with u to the 12th. And then this integrand becomes remarkably similar to the ones that I've seen before. I distribute that u to the 12th, and then they just become simple power rules. Okay, so don't forget about my one-third out front. I'm going to take some antiderivatives. The antiderivative u to the 13th is 1 14th u to the 14th plus the derivative here I get 3 thirteenths u to the 13th and then my plus c. Alright, so I'm going to distribute that 1 third and sub all my, or my z stuff back in. So my first coefficient is a 1 over 42, that's the 1 third times 1 14th, and then u to the 14th plus distribute the one-third here and I get a one-thirteenth times u to the thirteenth and then plus c. Whoops. C. Okay, so those are a few of our more advanced methods. We're going to take a look at one more thing on the back. We're going to look at what it means to do definite integration, okay? Because all these ones that we've done so far have been indefinite integration. So these are going to be slightly less complicated, slightly less complicated than the ones we saw in the front. And then we have some AP problems that we're going to do together. Okay, so this one. The method works the same, okay? Except remember, the idea that we've been going off of the last two lessons is that everything in the integrand needs to go from x stuff to u stuff. So here the whole integrand, this is all x stuff, this is all x stuff. Here's the thing that people forget about is the 0 and the 1. Those are x values. x equals 0 to x equals 1. We need to replace those as well and we'll talk about how once we get there. So we start with our u substitution. Our u is always the function that looks like it's physically nested. So that's the x squared plus 1. And then for our derivative we write du equals 2x dx we have an x dx, we don't have a 2x dx, so I'm just going to divide both sides by 2. Okay, so now I'm going to start to sub things in. And what I have to do to get my x bounds is I have to plug these bounds into this equation right here. Okay, so here's where these new bounds come from. So 0, that's an x bound. So I'm going to plug x equals 0 in right here. 0 squared plus 1, and now my u bound is 1. Then you can plug the 1 in. If you plug 1 in here, 1 squared plus 1 is 2. So my x bounds were 0 to 1, my u bounds are now 1 to 2. Again, all I did is I plug these x bounds into my u substitution function, because everything has to be turned in terms of u. Okay, now x squared plus 1 to the third. I'm going to write that as u to the negative third. And the x dx gets replaced with a 1 half du. And as always, I can just throw the constant out front. Okay, so here's how this works. I have 1 half times the antiderivative of this. The power pops up to negative 2. And I divide by negative 2. And then I integrate from 1 to 2. The good thing about definite integration is that I don't have to resubstitute x because I already changed my bounds to be u bounds, so I just plug them right in. So x is kind of gone because your final answer here is a number, not an expression. And so once I make the substitution here, I don't have to make it again. So I just plug those bounds right in. So this is, I have a negative one-fourth, plug in my upper bound of 2 to the negative second, 
minus a negative one fourth and plug in my upper or lower bound of one to the negative second. Then I just clean it up. So negative one fourth times two to the negative second, which is one fourth, and then plus one fourth times one, one over one. Okay, so I get a negative sixteenth plus a fourth. So this is like a four sixteenths. So I end up with three sixteenths. And that is my final answer. And you could always check. If I were to plug this thing right into my calculator, remember it would give me an answer, it would give me three sixteenths. All right, so the weird thing about these is that you change your bounds as well. Okay, so let's do another one. U substitution here, I'm going to sub out an x minus 9. Then this is a nice simple one because the derivative of x minus 9 is still just 1. So du dx, that's a direct substitution there. Now my bounds are what I need to worry about. So plug in 10. 10 minus 9 gives me 1. So my lower u bound is 1. Now plug in 17. 17 minus 9 is 8, so my upper u bound is 8, and then I just sub everything else in. So this now becomes u to the negative 2 thirds, and then the dx gets replaced with the du. So like I said before, definite integration by substitution, once you get to this point, you just solve it. You don't have to worry about subbing back for x. You're just done. Your answer is a number. Okay, so when I take the antiderivative, my power goes up from negative 2 thirds up to positive 1 third, and then I divide by one-third. Okay, and I'm evaluating this from one to eight. So three, and then eight to the one-third, minus three and one to the one-third. Okay, so three times eight to the one-third, that's the cube root of eight, so that's two, minus three times one. All right, so I end up with six minus three, which gives me three. Okay, so these next ones, these multiple choice ones, we're going to look at all together. Um, remember with definite integration that you don't have to sub back for x. That's kind of what we were doing right here when we sub those out. All right?